Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lorraine Bodner, and I am a licensed clinical professional counselor. I have worked with the LOSS program at Catholic Charities for the past 24 years. I do this part-time in addition to my full-time job in senior services at Catholic Charities. I'm sure that among us tonight, there may be some people who are brand new to the LOSS program, and uh, we say welcome to you, and we also say that, you know, let me extend my condolences for the reason that you are here with us, but we're glad that you're able to be with us tonight. Some of us are seasoned grievers in that we have perhaps lost many people in our lives. I know I've lost grandparents, parents, I've lost my brother, I have lost very good friends, I've lost my husband. So some of us have many losses in our lives and the death of any loved one is not easy to experience, whether it comes without warning or whether it comes after a long struggle with an illness. But dealing with a death by suicide and the ensuing process of mourning, of bereavement, is probably one of the very most challenging. Because survivors may find themselves having recurring thoughts about the death and the circumstances around the death, replaying it over and over again, uh, remembering their loved ones, thinking about their loved one's final moments or the last conversation that they had with their loved one. I know almost every survivor that I have worked with has grappled on some level with the complicated question of why. Why did this happen to my loved one? And they also find themselves slipping into a related question of, are they in somehow responsible? Many will relive their loved one's final days or weeks or months over and over again, searching for clues and trying to figure out what they may have missed or what, if they misinterpreted some sign. Post-traumatic stress disorder can develop with intrusive images surfacing unbidden that create a great deal of anxiety. We know that while it has lessened somewhat, unfortunately there's still a stigma attached to mental illness and to suicide. And this can contribute to some survivors' reluctance to acknowledge or disclose the circumstances of the death. Sometimes family members will disagree with one another about what to share with other people. And if they've made the decision to keep it a secret, that can be difficult for survivors then to speak openly and to get the support that they deserve. It can also lead to isolation and confusion and shame. So suicide seems to give rise to a lot of conflicting emotions. We can realize on the one hand that the person who died was struggling emotionally and found themselves just in intolerable circumstances, feeling very hopeless. But we can also find ourselves feeling angry, feeling abandoned or rejected, betrayed, and sometimes overwhelmingly sad, lonely, broken, damaged, thinking that we were not enough to keep our loved one alive. And what you believed about your loved one, about yourself, about your relationship, and about your world has somehow been totally shattered. So tonight, my goal is to consider some strategies for dealing with loss, some strategies to cope with the changes in life that have been foisted upon you and through, through the death of your loved one. And how do you reestablish your world order and somehow align your loss with your overall life story? How do you keep going? How do you once again embrace life? Well, grief is a natural process to be experienced. Grief has been likened to be as individual as our fingerprints. The reality is that each person is going to do this differently and that there's no right or wrong way to grieve, to experience grief. There actually are no rules. There's no set timetable. If someone tells you you should be doing something by the end of the first month 
or how you should be feeling by the end of the first year. Just disregard that. There are no rules for grief. It is not a test. It is not a competition. And as Earl Rollman says, grief is not a dis disorder. It's not a disease or a sign of weakness. It is an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. It's the price you pay for love. And the only cure for grief is to grieve. Now, like you, I've read many books on surviving suicide, or maybe you will be reading many books about surviving suicide. I've read, and more importantly, I've learned from Father Ruby, the founder of the Lost Program, that survivors do better when they can lean into the loss, when they could acknowledge it, when they can find space within themselves to be in relationship with the loss, to honor the fact that the feelings that they are experiencing are real, and when they can create a narrative about their changed life. We often say that grief is a journey. Well, I feel that it's true, but not necessarily a journey that has any final destination. The journey of grief is most often very convoluted. It's a very jagged path. It's not a linear path whatsoever. There's gonna be ups and downs and movement backward and forward. And there are many obstacles along the way. Because suicide often leaves its survivors with a traumatic aftermath, there are many layers involved and there are no simple answers. I think any sudden, violent, or totally unexpected death leaves one with trauma. I think what we have just seen in the last few days, the last few weeks with the mass shootings in Buffalo, in Uvalde, we can see how much trauma there is within those, those settings. And I'm sure many of you and many of us have been very affected by that as in our daily lives. For those who are grieving, you are experiencing and watching other people, other families grieve, and it just adds to your own grief. A mother of a son who died by suicide once said that it is impossible to describe the pain. She likened it to one of the worst emotional agonies and un, just an unimaginable suffering while still being alive. She compared it to having open heart surgery without any anesthesia. And the surgeon goes in and removes part of the heart, creating this big deep hole in the chest. And then the doctor tells you to get dressed and go on with your life like nothing ever happened. And from what I've witnessed over the years, it's many people have spoken like that, how it is so absolutely physically, emotionally, spiritually, just a ripping out of parts of their body, like their heart has been damaged by this horrible, horrible loss. And what is necessary to not avoid it or to try to escape from it. Dr. Wolfelt, who is one of my favorite authors, uh, about loss, about grief, says your pain is the key that opens your heart and ushers you on your way to healing. Sounds a little masochistic, I know, but I believe that one really has to befriend the pain of the loss in order to get closer to it and then to become self-compassionate. We have to acknowledge the pain and then confront it. Now, this is about grief being life altering. Most of the sentences on this page are probably obvious truths, but perhaps the last one is not. So the sentences are, suicide challenges our assumptions about the world. Suicide survivors are an at-risk population. Survivors are usually filled with questions and concerns, experiencing a multitude of feelings and reactions. Most need support and comfort from others. Survivors will never be exactly the same people they were. And then the one that sometimes people question is the final one. We can survive this, and survivors have within them the ability to heal. Life can go on to find meaning and purpose. 
I really think that in our individual counseling, especially at the loss program, that we, this is one of our goals is to try to promote the survivor's strengths and their competence to help them be able to manage their grief and encourage them to build on those strengths. We as clinicians and then as our facilitators who work in our groups, our goal is to accompany you, to companion you on part of your journey of assimilating and integrating your grief. I know we try to emphasize the individual nature of grief because we respect the unique relationship that you had with your loved one. You, the survivor, are not the problem. The problem is the problem, and grief is the problem. And it becomes more manageable, more normal, and less overwhelming when we can view it as a problem outside of ourselves and not something that's wrong with us, not something that's pathological within us, because sometimes grief will become pathologized, but it, grief is not an illness. Grief is an experience. It is a normal human experience, a normal human condition. And it is the necessary and the very heavy price that we all pay because we have loved and then we have lost someone. Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy certainly lost people in her life. And this is a quote from her. It has been said, time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain. In time, the mind, protecting its sanity, covers them with scar tissue and lessens, the pain lessens, but it is never gone. And I guess I agree. Uh, you will have remnants of the wound. There will be a scar. Some of you may have read the book by Carla Fine, No Time to Say Goodbye. Uh, in that, she says, you may always live with feelings of tremendous sadness and regret. You can also experience moments of real happiness and feelings of hope for the future. Sorrow and joy can coexist within humans. And when they do, this is when forgiveness will follow. It may be a lifelong process. So how do we chart our path through grief? How do we explain the death of our loved one to ourselves and to others? And how do we create a narrative for your life after such a traumatic loss? How do we move forward from our pain without losing the relationship with our loved one? Some survivors have told me that they have felt as though they have been dropped into a totally different world, into a country that they don't know, into a landscape that they don't understand. Uh, they don't know the language. They don't know how to maneuver through what they look upon as like quicksand of their emotions that just drag them down into places that is unfamiliar and places where they previously didn't even know existed. How does one accept the knowledge that this unfamiliar landscape is the place where they're now living? How does one relearn to live in the new world without the presence of their loved one, where the life patterns that you once knew are now disrupted and where the shape of one's life is forever changed. The future that you thought there would be is no longer possible. We've learned over and over again in loss, in the loss program, how individual each person's grief journey is. Each member is a family member is affected differently Parents ex experience the loss differently from siblings, and each sibling ex experiences it differently from one another. So how do we chart our own growth? How do we navigate through this? I think sometimes with a traumatic loss, we don't even know where to begin. We can't even figure out what we're experiencing. We don't even understand our own emotions because we're just experiencing emotional confusion. So many emotions are just piling upon us. I think that is a normal reaction to a traumatic event. We may feel we want to scream, to yell, to shout out, to rage, or we may totally pull back 
we want to isolate ourselves from everyone. You know, did you find yourself frequently feeling angry or tense or jittery? Do you have heart palpitations, sweating, hyperventilating, experiencing flashbacks of the trauma of when you found your loved one? Or if you were not the one to find your loved one, of imagining what it was like for someone who did or dwelling on what that person, your loved one was going through in those moments, those final moments before their death. And then people will say to you, how are you doing? How are you? And often we find ourselves just only whispering the word fine. I'm pretty sure many of you probably answer that word when people ask you that question, how you are. And we may say this just to deflect the attention from ourselves because we just don't wanna go there. We wanna move away from the questions because we can just feel that there may be a whole interrogation coming our way. Sometimes we say this because we just, we feel like we need to reject our other feelings or we fail to give words to them. Maybe to protect the person who asked us or maybe to insulate ourselves from the feelings and to just protect ourselves. And sometimes we just don't know how to give voice to our emotions. And maybe the person that asks us is just a person with whom we don't wanna share. For some of us, I think not giving voice to our emotions has been a pattern for our whole lives. We may lack comfort trying to speak our feelings to others. Feelings may not have been respected in our family of origin or some, in some of our current relationships. And we simply may not have ever had an opportunity to develop our own emotional intelligence, which is the ability to understand, use, and manage our emotions in positive ways, to relieve stress, to communicate effectively, and to empathize with others, to overcome challenges and diffuse conflict. Some of us just have not developed that. When we add the trauma of a death by suicide to our reality, we may realize that we don't even know how to speak of it. I know I have sat in individual, individual counseling session with persons who have lost their loved ones and they really are silent for almost the entire time. They cannot find words to give me an idea of what they experience. It is just too, it is just too searing. There's the pain is too great, but they don't know how to give words to it. So I see that as part of my, my role is to help them find the words, to help them uh, experience, to learn what they're experiencing. Because the grief is not a life experience that can be approached strictly from a thought rational thought perspective, we may be really hampered when we have an inability to feel emotions. And I found that in working with survivors that grief requires attention to emotions and that those who deny their feelings, who can't really open up their hearts to feelings, they're the ones that really struggle. So if that is, if that is you, if you find that you're feeling that way, I would really, really, uh, encourage you to get into a in one-on-one -on -one individual counseling with one of our clinicians because they will help you to be able to give voice to what you are experiencing. Along the way, people may ask you the question, how are you? And it's really up to you to decide who you want, how you want to respond to that. You know, with acquaintances, with people that you don't have a close relationship, brief answers, are always very self-protective. You could say something like, well, my husband was very ill and died as a result of his depression. I love him and missing, I miss him terribly, but I know he wants me to continue on. Or you could say something like, some days are better than others. Thank you for asking. Or I'm just trying to get on day by day. I'm struggling, I know it will be a long journey. But again, thank you for your concern. And there's always the answer, I just prefer not to talk about it. But thank you, thank you for asking, but I really prefer not to talk about it. 
it's within you to be able to share as much as you want with others. You know, if people are your friends, if they're close friends and family, maybe even close coworkers, I think then you may want to expand on how you're feeling. In our individual counseling and in our groups, that's when we invite you to reflect on how you are managing. We encourage you to open up your heart in a safe place, in the safety of those who have been on this walk before you, and also in the safety of the one-on-one -on -one counseling experience where you are met without any judgment. So, what coping strategies have you found to be helpful? Now, coping can be defined as what people do to minimize stress. It's commonly seen in health psychology as problem-focused, that is directed at reducing the threats and losses of illness, emotion, or grief, or it's emotion-focused, namely directed at reducing the negative emotional consequences. Now, here I have a picture of a toolbox because in our monthly group meeting that I attend, uh, Tom Klemkin, who is our loss facilitator, he often reminds us in our group about having a toolbox, gathering a toolbox of strategies for coping. And I think one of the most important tools that we can add to the toolbox is actually the story of your loved one, that we wanna be able to tell the story, not only the story of the death, but tell the story of the life of your loved one. The circumstances of someone's death, when those circumstances are sad or tragic, should not become a prism through which we then see that person's whole life. That's what Father Ronald Rollheiser said. And he is one of my favorite people to uh, speak about death uh, by suicide. He writes a column, at least he used to, once a month a year, one month uh, a year, he would have a, a, a column and it would always be dealing with suicide and how, especially how the Catholic church was viewing suicide. And I don't know if you can see, this is a book by him, Bruised and Wounded, Struggling to Understand Suicide by Ronald Rollheiser. I think survivors uh, have shared with me, you know, they have felt as though their world has fallen apart, that it's no longer orderly or understandable to them. They realize that there were parts of their loved one that they didn't know. And they've come in, they've questioned their own identity because that has become so shaken by the suicide. Many people have engaged in an intense review of what happened and why it happened and how other people played a part in what occurred. They examined their own role in the suicide. There's many have a perceived failure to have been supportive of their loved one or to recognize the depth of the suffering and their inability to prevent the suicide. Some have shared that they had no idea that their loved one was suffering. Lots of things come to light, but only in hindsight. Most survivors in time realized that they were not all knowing, that they were not in control. They were not able to control another person. And they realized that they will never know the absolute truth about the story, about the loved one's suicide. You know, when we think about being in control uh, and not being in control, I've had uh, experiences dealing with uh, two loss survivors. Uh, one was uh, well, actually, two, it was a couple who lost their 11 year old son to suicide. And we think uh, we should be able to have pretty good control over an 11 year old. But you are not with the child even all 24 hours a day. And even though he they had they knew he was struggling with attention uh, deficit and uh, they believe bipolar disorder, even at the age of 11, they had him in therapy. It was a very loving family. There were six children all together. He was the youngest. They were all aware that he was struggling. He found a time when he could be alone and he took his own life. I have another lost client who uh, 
lost a 10 year old son. Again, we think we should be able to control our children, but even with children, we cannot be in control. Okay. So in order to rebuild one's life after a loss, I have found that it's necessary, a necessary healing task is for the survivors to talk and to develop a bearable narrative of the suicide one that works well enough for survivors so they can get some relief from the question of why and include in the words of Jack Jordan, who is a clinical scholar of suicidology, to include a realistic and fair explanation of what happened, why it happened, and what responsibility the survivor should realistically and fairly assume for the event. So therefore, I think one of the most important tools you can add to your toolbox is the narrative, the story of your loss. Another way I think to cope with grief is to be aware that you can continue the relationship with your loved one, that you can remain in connection with that person. And one way to do it is to say his or her name, to remember her to reflect on how he influences you even now. A personal choice I made after my husband's death, and he died in 2001. He died from a complications to a brain tumor, uh, is that I continue to talk to him. On his birthday, on our wedding anniversary, on the anniversary of the day I met him, which was October 25th, I will put my husband's picture on the table. And as, as I eat my breakfast, he will start the day with me. And in the evening, I will light a candle and he will be with me again as I eat my dinner. I maintain a relationship with him. I talk to him a lot, maybe not out loud, but I talk to him in my head. I remember things that he told me. I remember times that we had together. When I can't find a tool in his workshop in my basement, I will ask him to help me find it. And almost every single time I am just led to it. So I encourage you to maintain a relationship with your loved one. I encourage you to say their name out loud. Sometime in the day, whether you're talking to someone else or maybe it's just when you're in front of the bathroom mirror and you're talking to yourself, just say good morning to that person. Remember that person. Seek ways to remain in relationship. Recall stories, even the difficult ones, but also seek out a positive story for every difficult story. Father Ruby always says that what would be even worse than their death would be that they would be forgotten. And telling their stories is one way that we can keep their spirits alive. If you have children, tell them stories of their parent or grandparent, their aunt, their uncle, their sibling, so they come to know the person. I have had people tell me that their children have built a relationship with deceased members of the family. They were too young to have even met in person. They have met them. They have met those people through photographs, through stories, and other remembrances of them. You know, they know that they have an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, whoever has, whoever has passed, they know that person. The fact is we will never forget them. And for some looking through photographs may be helpful. It may bring back happy memories. For others that may be very painful, especially if you are someone for whom your loss is rather recent. And you may find that you just wanna ease into the pictures and ease into the stories. But again, I think it's always important to think how you are still being influenced by your loved one. You know, uh, is it just when I remember that my husband would say, you really need to always keep watching when it's time for an oil change in the car. That's still an influence that he had on me. My husband was a great collector of art. My home is filled with artwork. He was also a crafter where he created lamps and tables out of copper tubing that he soldered together in different uh, forms. And then he put glass on them like glass tables and he found 
globes and shades for lamps that he could create. My home is filled with them. That is how he has influenced me, you know, and I keep, I keep at least one of these lit at all times. So it makes it feel like he is still with me. In your toolbox, you may want to gather ideas for how you can remember your loved one through some rituals. Rituals, family traditions, maybe if you are religious, maybe saying special prayers. Uh, in our support groups, you know, we learn about how others have chosen to memorialize their loved ones, whether it would be uh, you know, uh, lighting the Yarsite candle or having masses said for the person, or having special services, uh, memorial services, special dinners. I know uh, some people have like on birthday celebrations, they come together and they eat a meal that was a favorite of their loved one. For some people, visiting the gravesite is important. For others, that is not cons consoling whatsoever. And then I hope all of you will consider coming in November to our annual loss evening of remembrance. I think this is a wonderful way for us to gather together as a loss community and to be with one another to give support and then also to remember, remember our loved ones. Some people want to honor their loved ones by creating something. Uh, some of you, I think, have made squares for the Lost Memorial quilts. I think uh, that is a wonderful way where you take a square of muslin and you create some kind of a picture on it. Some people put the actual photograph of their loved one. Some people draw things and put their name and their birth date, their death date, however you want to do it. I know we are still creating uh, the Lost quilts. I made a quilt of my husband's uh, shirts after he passed. My daughter was only 12 years old and uh, I made a quilt for her of his shirts. And uh, it's a quilt and it's also a pillow. And so when she went away to college, that became something that I gave her at that point that she could take with her. So her dad was with her in some way. You know, and there were memories attached to some of these shirts from the time when we used to take vacations at, in San Diego at the beach cottages. And this was something that he wore. And I made sure I selected, I kept enough shirts that I would have, they, that were meaningful, that I knew I wanted to do something special. Some people have planted a tree or a special bed of flowers. They make a, a, turn it into a living memorial. Some people donate money to charity or they will do some kind of a service project to honor their loved one. Some people have started scholarships or they have carried on a dream or a project that your loved one was involved in or invested in or wanted to be invested in. And so it's a way that you can honor your loved one. Or sometimes I think we should we should think about doing something that they wanted to do. I know uh, some I have heard about someone taking a trip to Italy, uh, and it was that was something that uh, her husband, the woman's husband, always they wanted to do together. And it took her a while, but she said, "I am eventually going to do it because that was his dream. That was our dream, and I want to do it. I'm going to live out that dream." So here's some pictures actually of that. And that circle is a labyrinth, if you're not sure about a labyrinth. And the quilt, I have to say my quilt was nicer than that quilt, but that's a quilt, like a possible quilt where you just take different pieces of the shirt. And some people, you know, um, through uh, motion, through exercise activity, whether it's Tai Chi, yoga, whether it's something creative like the music, or woodworking, gardening, painting. Here's how we can, ex some ideas for expressing um, your grief creatively. And you'd say, well, aren't those just hobbies? Well, they may be hobbies, but I think they're much more than hobbies. It all depends on like the intentionality you put into these. If you are journaling, if you are drawing, if you are, intentionally remembering your loved one as you do this. 
And for poet with writing poetry, with writing prose, you know, we have in the loss um, program, we have a writing group that is uh, a wonderful tool for healing and for building community by sharing activities and with one another, you know, writing, getting a prompt about what you would write about. But composing music, uh, maybe we're not all into that, but there are maybe some people that would want to com compose some kind of music to honor their loved one. Dancing, filmmaking, jewelry, even creating a memorial web page. I have seen some really beautiful uh, memorial web pages of people, and I think it's got to be such a, a healing process to do that to pick out the, either the readings that, that are most important, the pictures. It's a way to creatively express your grief, but also to honor the person. And then some that I like, baking and cooking uh, are great. I think, uh, and if you don't know how to do those things, this might be a time where you would want to take a class, you know, whether it's through the high school district or the the college, the community college, to take some of these classes, whether it's woodworking, carpentry, home decorating, something that will be able to, uh, a way to, for you, as I said, it's about intentionality, for a way to intentionally remember the person. Uh, maybe it's making the foods that your loved one like to eat. I know in, during the pandemic, a lot of people got a hold of that sourdough starter and they made a lot of bread. And if maybe, you know, you're sharing the bread with other people, you know, I made this for you. And as I was making it, I was remembering my, hu my husband, or I was remembering my son when I made this. Fostering an animal, you know, especially if, if your loved one was into animals, this would be a way for you to, to help, help an animal, but also to remember something that was important to your loved one. And then reading, walking a labyrinth. Albert Hubbard said a cure for grief is motion because grief is physically and emotionally and mentally, all of it, exhausting. It's such a exhausting process when you are living without the person that you have loved. Intellectually, we know that exercise is very good for both our physical health and our mental health. Exercise, physical exercise can, can contribute a great deal to our happiness and doing it regularly can help us deal with depression, with sadness and with anxiety. Some of us are not really into exercise in a big way. So I'm gonna change the word to even movement or energy management, but we know that movement is good for our heads. It's good for our hearts. It really is a medicine of sorts. It can change our brains. We've really become a sedentary culture where we park our car near our workplace, see how close we can get to the building, or we take the train and we just don't walk the way our ancestors used to walk. I read that thousands of years ago, our ancestors walked an average of eight miles a day. And I asked myself, how far did I walk today? Very, very, <laughs> not very far. You know, how did we generate and how do we manage our energy? This would be something that we, we can uh, work on of, of finding a way to physically get involved. You don't have to do anything radical or strenuous. Many lost clients have shared with me how walking in their neighborhood helped help them. Some people spend time in nature. I know the Chicago Botanic Garden has been a favorite place peaceful place for many to walk and just to commune with nature and beauty. I think uh, if you can be near water, water is said to be very healing when dealing with grief. Going to a local river or to, lake, to a lake where the water is shallow enough that you can actually walk, wade in it, it's both ther therapeutic and just very soothing to many people. But just walking itself, whether it's you know, an activity you do solely, or if it's, if you want to walk with another person. And then uh, some people have gotten involved with the uh, out of the darkness walk. Uh, so that is another very healing process 
where people walk, uh, they start it in the evening and they walk all night and there's a lot of activities. That's with the AFSP, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you now, and if you wanna put in the chat, is there any other kind of coping mechanism like I've just spoken of that I didn't talk about that you may, uh, that you that you practice or that you want to uh, tell us about, and if not, that's okay. Take time to cry. Yes, I would say that is important. It is important not to keep those emotions pent up inside. To let yourself to let yourself feel and to let yourself cry every day, if that's what you need to do. Okay, I'm gonna move on then. Maybe. I think in everyone's toolbox there needs to be self-care components that entails taking care of your physical, mental, and spiritual health. Hopefully you can see that the ones we mentioned are part of self-care, but then it also, self-care also entails connecting. And we as humans have a basic need to connect. Uh, so I would really encourage everyone to begin to, when you start the whole grief process to see your primary care physician. Just check in with your doctor. And also take the time to communicate, to communicate your needs with your family, with your friends, but look for good listeners. Not everybody in our circles are good listeners. So seek out the ones that are good listeners. And then I would also encourage people to seek therapy. Consider individual counseling, even if you're part of a couple who has lost a loved one. Each one of you should do counseling on your own, I think. It's, it's much more freeing. You're able to speak much more freely because without the idea of perhaps I would hurt the other person. And I would encourage you to attend support groups, to connect with faith communities, if that is something that's important to you. Give yourself permission to have fun. Because you have lost someone, it does not mean that this has to, you can no longer have fun. It's like we talked before where you can have sorrow and you can have joy, you can balance them. There are times when you can have fun and give yourself permission to have fun, to smile, to laugh. And then, I, and I, I'm gonna give you an example of someone that I've worked with for a long time. Uh, she lost her husband. And one of the ways that she and a friend of hers, I think they were both in a, in the loss monthly group, or maybe they did an eight week group and they got to know each other. They joined a square dancing group. So it was a way for them to connect with other people. It was a way to them, for them to have physical exercise. And it was a way for them to actually have fun. They gave themselves permission to do that once a week. And for, for my client, she actually expanded and she was doing it several times a week. And then years later, she actually met someone, met a gentleman there who, had, who became her significant other. So she gave herself permission to have fun. Also plan ahead. Now the planning ahead can be especially for uh, painful reminders, for those moments of like that you know an anniversary is coming or those, uh, especially early on uh, when you may have uh, waves of grief that come on. You know, uh, we always talk about uh, when you're going somewhere, we always suggest that if you can drive yourself, if you're going to someone's home, if you're doing going to a party or something that you're a little not sure if you're ready to handle, that you plan ahead and find that you have an exit strategy in case you, have it that it's difficult for you. Because you can't, you can't always know what's going to come your way, but you can also try to, uh, try to plan ahead if possible. 
but just knowing that they may happen helps you accept them. And then I would say, like I said, plan ahead for grief provocations. These are anniversaries, birthdays, milestones that can reawaken memories and painful feelings. I think holidays, uh, sometimes receiving a wedding invitation of a friend's child when your child uh, has, has passed is, is difficult. Knowing that your child is going to remain a certain age and that other child, that other is moving on and now getting married. Sometimes the change of seasons can be difficult for people. And I know for me, I found that when the calendar year, my husband died in 2001, in, Feb, in March of 2001, and I was not prepared for when the calendar at the end of December, when we flipped over that calendar to January 1st, of 2002, I was not prepared for how I felt about that. It caused tremendous upset and sadness in me that he was never alive in this year. So you may want to decide to change things up for holidays as you see how you celebrate holidays. Uh, this is something that you should probably share with your loved ones, with the people in your family, and think about ways that you can make it things more tolerable for like big events that are coming up. For, I know for some survivors, even going to the grocery store can be very painful. Uh, so some people have temporarily changed where, what store they go to, where they shopped in. Um, you cannot plan for every possible situation that may induce a strong grief reaction, but you can try just to be aware that they, they happen. You want, you know, you, you need to grieve in your own time, in your own way, and not rush yourself. Because losing a person in any way is difficult. Losing someone to suicide, to the trauma of that, is a tremendous blow. And healing has to occur in its own pace. Don't be hurried by anyone else's expectations that it's been long enough. Expect that you will have emotional setbacks. There will be days that will be better than others, even years after the death. And that's okay. You know, as we said before, grief and healing does not happen in a straight line. If you've Someone who's lost your spouse, your partner, your significant other who was a primary means of financial support for you or with whom you shared financial obligations, this, is, this can be very difficult where you have to assess your financial situation. And I would really caution you to find a trusted like financial person to help you with that. And then exercise caution because sometimes medical issues arrive, excuse me, find money issues arrive very quickly, immediately, and especially if there are medical expenses or funeral costs, and then you have the day-to-day -day bills. And so you're likely to have lots of questions. So I would just caution you to, to uh, proceed uh, carefully and slowly if you can. So here are a few other ideas for self-care. I'm sure you can think of many, many more beyond these. Uh, these would be things that you might want to put in your toolbox for things that you can do to take care of yourself, whether it's just soaking in a warm tub or whether it's taking some brief naps, listening to special music, working in a garden. Um, take, I like the one taking a day off from work to do nothing, praying, meditating. Uh, I would, you know, I know for many people, they hold on to comfort items. It could be uh, photos. It could be a favorite shirt, sweatshirt, flannel shirt of their loved one. It could be a special pillow, or it could be like I made for my daughter, a memorial quilt. Some people I know carry little inspirational poems or quotes with them that they can just kind of pull out when they feel like they need it, that they can just read. Some people keep a, like a little keepsake or a small personal item that belonged to their loved one. 
If they can keep it in their purse, they can keep it in their pocket. So it's something they just need to touch because they will bring comfort. Okay. Now it says, don't be afraid to be alone at times. Uh, I think grief is a very lonely and individual process. We grieve together, but we also grieve alone because we each do it so differently. Uh, we all process loss in our own individual ways. And we can certainly empathize with another's grief as they can with ours. But mutual grief is never identical. Iris Bolton in her book, My Son, My Son, when she talked about her family and she and her husband and how they grieve, she said, we did our grieving within our own beings in the stillness of our private souls, separate and alone. And we healed in our own ways, according to our own timetables. But at the same time, we shared our sorrows and so received the wonderful kind of healing that comes from dividing a burden. And I know Mary and Kaylee in our uh, group that I'm in and will met will often talk about how a burden shared is able, you're able to manage a burden shared. I think we do need to try to spend time alone with ourselves and with our grief. We need to have those moments when we can just genuinely be ourselves, where we don't have to put on a face for other people and where we allow ourselves to feel what we're feeling, to let those real feelings surface, where we're not trying to deny our feelings or to protect other people, when we're not concerned about what's happening with our children or with our spouses, but many of us don't have the luxury of sitting here on the rock formation, looking out at the sea alone with our feelings. And for some of us, the only alone time we have is when we're taking a shower or when we're in our car. And I think that's why uh, we so often uh, hear that so many people find some of those spaces, like in the car is a place when the tears just start to flow. And I think it's because it's a place some of us can be alone where we can just allow our feelings to surface. So whenever we can take those moments, do. But also seek out ways to connect with others. And the way we do this is that we tr try to avoid too much isolation. Because as we said, grief can be terribly lonely and isolating experiences. But opportunities to make the bereavement journey a communal experience can also be vital in helping feel support. That's why our loss groups, our support groups, our eight-week groups are coming um, in one-to-one -one counseling with a clinician can be so uh, important and so life-giving to us because it allows us to speak what's happening with our, in ours, but it also allows us to do some comparison in, in that we look, we can compare our reactions to those of other survivors and we learn new adaptive skills and we can observe how other people are learning how to cope with their similar uh, circumstances. Susan Anderson has said, grief shared in community distributes the burden over many shoulders. Collectively, we can help one another. This reaching out to others becomes a blessing to each person. We release our own grief and then can help shoulder someone else's burden. And I know many people come to the support group uh, after uh, sometimes they've, they've lost their loved one years ago, but they come to the support group to give back they say, because they want to be there as, as someone that has actually lived through this and survived it, and now they can give hope to other people. So I really cannot speak highly enough about the positives that can come to us through the support groups. They are probably one of the greatest tools in the toolbox. So if you are someone, especially for whom this is a new loss, I would really highly encourage you to attend monthly groups, whether they're on Zoom, or I know we're gonna start some of them in person, or an eight-week group. 
on Zoom is also very, very profitable for you to come to. The one-on-one -on -one counseling is another possible social interaction for you. There are other uh, resources online, especially there are blogs, there's online support groups, there's the Alliance of Hope for Suicide Loss Survivors, SOS groups, Survivors of Suicide, there are blogs, um, and our side of suicide website and blog, there's chat groups, and there's also some very excellent TED Talks given by survivors of suicide that you may find helpful. Okay. I've also talked a lot about positive coping mechanisms, but what about those that are not so positive? And so I made a little list here of what are some, I think, unhealthy coping mechanisms when we practice some kind of self-destructive behaviors, using work as an escape, taking excessive time off from work, or using sleep as an escape, escaping through the use of alcohol, drugs, over or under eating, gambling, overspending, or sometimes over committing to activities. Uh, these are not necessarily the most healthy of coping mechanisms. I also think their anger reactions, behavior that physically or emotionally hurts another person, such as yelling, screaming, becoming physically abusive, those are not at all uh, healthy. It's okay to be angry. This is a normal reaction, but not to the point where you hurt yourself or someone else. Extreme denial reactions, where you're constantly pretending to yourself or to others that your loved one is still alive. And I've actually worked with some people that have, have tried to do that. They try to uh, convince themselves that their child was actually on um, studying abroad and that they were, and they were telling other people that that was happening too. No, their, their loved one had taken their own life. But that, was, that is not a healthy way to try to deal with, with loss. Uh, trying to erase someone's memory is also unhealthy. So some other poor coping mechanisms are avoidance or procrastination or extreme self-isolation. See if I can change the mechanism. Okay. I would caution you to beware how you use social media. I think it can be very helpful in letting know others know about your loss and asking for support. But as I say here, sometimes it can also attract internet trolls. And I think one of the last things you need when you are grieving is to get inappropriate, insensitive, and sometimes judgmental, abusive messages. So be very cautious on how you use social media. You may want to limit your social media use to a closed group rather than to a public posting that can be commented on by just anyone. Now, what if you experience suicidal thoughts? Because sometimes the pain is so intense that survivors will think about taking their own lives. I have found that some people have expressed their desire to die because they feel so bereft after the loss of their loved one. If these are feelings that persist or if you find that these feelings are growing stronger over time, this is where you need to confide in a professional. You need to tell a family member, you need to seek help. You need to speak with your own doctor, your own therapist, uh, you know, seek medical attention. Do not delay because your life matters to others. You have experienced what it's like to lose a person. You know the devastation. For something to happen to you now, think of your family and friends who are already devastated. This would just increase that 
and they would be so devastated by your loss. So I implore you to please, please seek professional help because sometimes unresolved grief can turn into complicated grief where the painful emotions are just so long lasting and so severe that you really have trouble resuming your life. All grief is difficult after suicide. This grief process is always complex, it's traumatic. And living with, uh, after a, a suicide, you have firsthand knowledge of that pain that that death has left, you. So please, please seek out help. Lucy Hoyne is one that, Hone is one that I really found her TED talk to be very, very uh, meaningful and helpful. It's about resilience. And she lost her daughter and I believe her friend and her daughter's friend uh, in an automobile accident. And it was just absolutely horrific. But her, she gives this fantastic TED talk on resilience. Learning to live with grief is learning to live in a shattered world. It's one of the things she said, and it's very true. Remember, grief is not a linear process. It's not an orderly progression. Sometimes you find yourself crying and you think, just a few minutes ago, I was feeling calm. What happened? And I heard someone say that grief is like a series of loops. You can circle back to where you were some time ago. It's not a straight line. The LOSS program is here to hopefully provide you with support in a safe and confidential environment. Our goal is to help you integrate this loss into your life, to be able to accept it as part of your personal history. It is not something that you're ever going to probably feel total peace with, but we hope that you will come to some sense of peace that you can go on and continue with your life knowing you're not, not alone. I know I often ask people in individual counseling in the darkest of times, where do you see any cracks of light? And I guess I would ask you to reflect on that. Where do you see any cracks of light? Where do you see any hope? I would suggest that you think about keeping a gratitude journal or even if you don't keep a journal, just before you go to bed at night, before you go to sleep, just look, think back on your day. And can you think, find one or two things that you, for which you are grateful for? Because I think an attitude of gratitude cannot be overstated when we are grieving. There are still some good, positive things happening in the world and in your world, even when you are feeling most crushed. There are still some, there's still some positive things and you may have to hunt for them and they may be small and it may be that someone spoke to you kindly or you maybe received a card from someone, you know, when they talked about your loved one, but it, it's, it's a way for us to help to focus on some good and help us to see that there is some light. I think gratitude can help us by enabling us to focus on what we have rather than exclusively on what we have lost. Okay. These are some references that I had. Actually, I wanna go back to this one um, because another part I would like to uh, suggest that you also try to practice yourself some random, just some acts of kindness every day. Uh, I know doing something that is for someone else takes us outside of ourselves. At least for me, it takes me outside of myself and it will simultaneously help another person and maybe just bring a smile. And for me, that's, that's a healing process. And I also urge you to think about forgiveness. Forgiveness for your loved one, for all those people who disappointed you along the way, for those people that couldn't handle your grief, uh, for those people who didn't know what to say, or they didn't say anything, maybe those people that just never have even acknowledged your loss, 
or they may have said the wrong thing. I think, I, I just think about forgiving them for their ignorance, maybe for their callousness, because they don't know. And we don't necessarily want them to know what that hurt is like. But also above all, I think, think about forgiving yourself. Your world may have been shattered. Your heart has been broken, definitely. But you are learning how to live with the grief. You know, as someone who walked with people and been a companion to others now for 24 years in this process, I've witnessed a lot of confusion and immense pain that a death by suicide leaves. But I also feel very privileged to be with those who people who have befriended their pain. I know I had already been working in the loss program for years before my husband died. And I know it was such a comfort to me to be just to be in the room with people who also had experienced tremendous loss. And my husband did not die by suicide. But I, I shared some of the same feelings of you know, wishing things were different, wishing I could have made different choices. So it, it was, for me, it was, a, it was a very profound experience to be with our survivors. And I feel very privileged that I have been with uh, the survivors for these years. I have been, be able, been able to behold the tremendous strength and the resilience, the love and the compassion that have been the byproducts of survivors grief journeys, because I just find uh, the resilience of our people is really amazing. So here were some references. And then this is a line from the song Anthem by Leonard Cohen. And again, it goes back to uh, where does the light come in? Ring the bell, which still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And I guess I think what a privilege it is to be with uh, survivors. And I would encourage you to come to monthly groups, to come to our one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling, to try, if you are newly bereaved especially, to try an eight-week group uh, because that is where you will you will receive support. We cannot change what has happened, but I think we can help people to be able to walk with this new reality and to live with this new reality. I know one of our loss guidelines at our support meetings is that we will not give advice to others. We will speak from the I position. I know the purpose of this evening has been to educate, to give you some ideas for coping, and really not to give you advice. I do know about being a companion to people whose lives have been shattered by suicide, but I have learned how to do this from you, the survivors, and I am grateful to you because you certainly inspire me. Oh, thank you so much, Lorraine. Okay, well, let me just, I, I think I'm almost done. I just think I Oh, okay, perfect. Page. I thought that that I was the page. Thought, that's okay. okay. No, I apologize. I was like, wait a second. I thought that was the last one. It isn't. My no, apologies. that isn't the last one, I guess. I have my, I have these out of order for some reason. Uh, let's see. I think when we come to, like the, like I said, the, the support group meetings are a great tool in the toolbox to attend them. I know not everyone feels as though they are a group person, but I think, you know, we don't expect that you have to speak at them. We encourage it. And I think it's very freeing when one is able to speak, but I would definitely encourage you to try a Zoom meeting and we will continue to have Zoom meetings. But in, and if you want to try a monthly meeting that is in person, or I would definitely encourage uh, newer bereaved people to, to uh, go to an eight-week group, to sign up for an eight-week group. I think hearing the stories of other survivors is what is so inspiring. Um, it, it's just, it helps, um, just helps us. Our facilitators 
are people that have walked in your shoes, are still walking in your shoes, and they give so much time and caring to the support groups. They're the ones who really uh, help us all. They inspire us to keep going because they keep pushing forward and they have endured this and they give us hope. And I also think we need to, along the way, acknowledge our own helplessness, that we cannot change the situation no matter what we do. So as I said before, I urge you to think about forgiveness, forgiveness for your loved one, for all those people who disappointed you, for those people who couldn't handle your grief, for those who did not know how to respond to you in your pain, for those who said the wrong things or for those who didn't say anything at all. And above all, think about forgiving yourself. Uh, we know your world has been shattered. Your heart has been broken, but you are learning how to live with your grief. So I thank you. I think I'm at the end. Let me see. Whoops, I did that one wrong. That's okay though, Lorraine. If you can actually, um, oh, I'm so sorry. Did you have a, a video to watch too? Okay. No, not really. It's just, it's, it was just the music. It's an instrumental version of Anthem by Leonard Cohen, but it's instrumental. So, and I just, I know somewhere along there, I, I did put in a gratitude, special gratitude to the Sunday, fourth Sunday of the month group and we'll met for the ways that they have shown such resilience and how they've educated me and they've helped uh, how they help one another cope with loss and how they've taught me so much. So I appreciate them and all of you. And I guess there's things in the chat that I should probably look at. There are, so I was actually gonna alert you to a couple of those things because I've been I've been popping some things in there too. Um, we had someone ask if you could show the resource slide again, if you wouldn't mind sharing I'm that. I'm gonna try to do that. Okay. And then, yeah. And some I don't think I have on there. I don't think I have uh, Iris Bolton's book, My Son, My Son. And I don't have No Time to Say Goodbye by Carla Fine. So that one I did pop in the chat. Okay, um, yes, I think I saw that. No Time to Say Goodbye. And then um, I can look up My Son, My Son also. But these are some, some good resources and um, part of... Um, some of our, our lost materials also that have um, just some recommendations on them. So some good ones. Um, we also had a, a question a while back, Lorraine, if you would be willing to sort of go back over um, the narrative formation piece and sort of what, what that looks like for, um, for survivors um, and sort of, you know, you gave such a nice mix of the practical things and the, you know, the, the more, you know, the things that we sort of do internally or mentally or emotionally. And that was just a, a question that was asked was about the narrative piece. Well, your narrative is your story. I think if you've ever, if you've gone on one and done any one-on-one -on -one counseling, or if you've gone to a support group, uh, part of what I know I do, I will always sit with someone and just say, tell me your story. Tell me the story of your loved one. And basically it's telling the story of what happened. But it, and in the beginning, it's so hard for people to tell the story of what, how their loved one died, what happened, what led up to it, whether they had any indicators beforehand of that they were struggling whether there was a diagnosed mental illness, whether there was an undiagnosed mental illness and they just knew that there was something not quite, you know, okay with the person. It's telling, it's telling your story. What is the story of your loved one's death? And then in our monthly groups, our eight week group, every time we come together, we ask that you introduce yourself, tell who you lost, tell how long ago it was, you know, say their name. That's part of the story. It's part of your, the way that you come to accept that this really happened, that this is reality, that you, that you have lost this person that you loved. And then it's, I mean, that you're, you form the narrative. You, and the narrative, you learn more as you go along. 
because we learn a whole lot in hindsight as we look back at how the person was living, how the person's last days were, or what we learn from other people. We may not have lived with the person who died. We may not have known what their day-to-day -day struggles were, or we may have. So it's, it's the narrative is what your story of your loved one. And then you're part of that narrative and how you are now dealing with it, how you are coping with it. That's part of the narrative too. Is that what you mean, Emily? Yes, I think so. I, we had a, a follow up question that just said, you know, do you do you have something that outlines the narrative? But I think given what you just said, it's so individual that mm -hmm. it's not it's not a worksheet that we can hand somebody in, in therapy. It's very much, you know, sort of that individual crafting that you do as you work your way through the different pieces of your loss. And like you said, where you fit in there. Um, so yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And we did have a couple of people um, who just mentioned that um, a couple other, you know, of their, their coping methods, talking about um, going to see art or listening to music, like you said, um, sad songs, sort of leaning into the grief sometimes. Um, and then another suggestion and trying to put together a bucket brigade of support people that you can go to because one person in the bucket cannot handle it all, um, which I think really speaks to, to some of that um, some of that collective grief that you were talking about too. Those are good. Those are very good. Very good options. Um, we had a question if um, we would post the the resource list. Um, if you're if you're not able to to grab it now, um, if you would like it for me to send it to you, I can take a screenshot of it and I can I can send it out via email, um, if that's helpful for folks. Something these are just things that these are resources that helped me as I prepared for this, and then as I said, I did do those other use those other books. I quoted some of those. Yes, and we do have a, a, a couple of the books um, here in the, the Lost Library. Um, if anyone's gone through an eight-week group or is interested in going through an eight-week group, we also include a literature list and, and a significant amount of readings um, that go along with, with those packets that are just things from different perspectives, different point of view, um, covering different topics on loss that we could also make available to you as well. Did anyone have any other uh, coping mechanisms that I, that were different. I'm going to go ahead and stop your share, Lorraine. So if anybody wants Thank to, you. to share, they're welcome to. <clears throat> I just I appreciated that you also mentioned, um, you know, some of the things that are maybe those maladaptive coping skills, you know, when we talk about reaching into our toolkit, um, that's often a coping mechanism that people already have, because it's something that got them through a hard place before, whether that was, you know, for the for the better, or, you know, caused its own kind of set of problems. And um, so I think that that was a, an important thing to, to highlight. So thank you for that. Does anyone have any um, other methods that they would like to share? Things that have maybe you know been helpful for them, um, different things that you've been able to implement, or things you might be think might be helpful for others. We are all ears. I think one thing that I was going to say, which I didn't say, uh, one person I knew. Uh, who lost her mother, her mother had taught her how to crochet and her mother was elderly. And so she actually, what she did was she made like little lap, blank, lap blankets, is that what they're called, lap, for the lap. And then she made those as she was doing it, she was remembering her mother. And then she took those and gave them to a long-term care facility to in, in you know memory of her mother. And I just think, that kind of thing, you know, we don't always think about that as being such a, as being a coping uh, strategy, but it is because it's allowing us to connect with our loved one, but we're also doing something for others. And I think that's just, that's uplifting. Absolutely. Um, sister Catherine uh, said that she likes to write letters to her sister, give her updates on what's happening, how she's feeling, um, any questions she might have, and, a, and sort of in place of, of a weekly phone call um, that they used to yeah. have. That, that's, I think that's beautiful. I know for me, I actually kept a journal after my husband passed away, 
And it was, I found myself writing to him rather than, you know, just like other journals that I've kept in the past was different. And once he passed away, it was writing to him, telling him what was going on. And yeah, that's beautiful. I agree. That's really beautiful. Um, and then Tish shared, um, Ooh, there it is. For me, going to my faith brings me peace. Um, maybe just a quiet moment or being in prayer. Certainly. Absolutely. Anything else coming through here? Don't want to miss anything. Make sure I got them all. Someone walked the Appalachian Trail in memory of their loved one. So that's pretty big. <laughs> Absolutely. I know that there was a, a documentary that came out. Um, I can't remember exactly when, maybe a year or two ago, um, called, I think it's called Scattering TJ. Um, and it's about a family who lost their, their son um, to suicide. And then people, um, his friends and just loved ones from all over the world um, took his ashes to spread in, in really beautiful places and places that would have um, really been special to him. And I thought that was lovely. Um, you know, we, uh, we had the, a really exciting um, opportunity to have David Axelrod join us for the brunch. And um, this isn't something he said during the brunch, but one of the things he said before was that his father had instilled this immense love of baseball. And then it became uh, David Axelrod's sort of link to his father's memory was remembering um, how much he loves baseball and then taking his own kids to go to the ballpark and, and that that was just something that he wanted to do. Um, then uh, I did so many things. I journaled, wrote letters, sat by the lake, talked to him, <laughs> read all the articles I could find. Me too, yes. Um, went to two years of counseling. Um, got to, oh, got together with friends for yeah for Steve Beck Day on his birthday. I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah, those are great. Those are great ideas. Yep. And I just, I love that there were just so many, so many suggestions because, um, you know, we're all just so individual and, you know, somebody might choose something from one column that works really well for them. And, you know, someone else is seeking that elsewhere. So, so many good ideas that people have, have found useful. So that's great. Oh, Judy, I'm sorry you were having trouble. I don't know. Okay. Let me know if you have a question or we'll, we can follow up. Oh, sure. Um, so maybe not everyone would find this helpful, but um, that I found peace talking to a medium. Um, so that's something that, you know, we've heard from several of our lost members, actually. Um, and one of the things that I think we, it kind of goes back to one of those guidelines, we respect everyone to utilize, you know, healing methods that work for them. That is something that has been a source of, of, of great, you know, comfort for several people. And I think that, you know, if that's your spiritual belief and, and a piece of, of, you know, sort of your um, individual beliefs, that's who are we to say what, what's healing and what isn't. So I agree. Oh, I see Julie, Judy, you were able to unmute. Did you have a question or a comment? I was just gonna um, let you know, I couldn't get um, most of the people on here and um, it was toward the end of the presentation that I was able to even put my own picture on here. So I don't know, I thought I saw a note that somebody else had their problem too, that they couldn't. Um, oh, it could, it could have been, yeah, yeah not. Sorry. Not everyone had had their cameras on, but I hope that you were you were able to hear us. I hope that 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 yeah. was coming through. I I, yeah. I did hear, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you, oh, Judy. I could good. I could see you. This is Donna. I, I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't switch to gallery view to see everybody just until recently. So I had that. Um, everybody was kind of down on the bottom, you know. Yeah. In one well, I, <laughs> I can see you. Yeah, and I can see Emily, and I can see uh, Lorraine. Lorraine, yeah. That, and, uh, those have to do with a couple of 
a couple of settings that I messed with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, no so that that's why oh, I, I promise okay. it, it wasn't anything, anything on your end. That was all me kind okay. of manipulating <laughs> things behind the oh, curtain over okay. here. So all good. All <laughs> good. Okay. I was changing settings on you. So that, that was, that was my doing. I, oh, well, yeah. Well, all of a sudden gallery view. I'm like, there it is. Where, how did it get here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I've got a couple of pictures. Hi, Judy. 